Thank you everyone for coming to this session of Vital Voices. Oh, wow, we're getting more people coming in, excellent. So this is our second event of the season. Uh, this is a, a joint Vital Voices, Vital Alumni session. Uh, we love to have vital, our Vital Voices are, are, are basically conversations that we like to have with, um, with people, educators, uh, people, professionals in criminal justice and social works because that represents our college. And in fact, I think we have Dean Schwartz here. If he is on the line, would you like to say something, Dean? Or actually, I don't know if he can. Can you? Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, I, I will continue. Um, we're, there's a little technical uh, glitch there. But so our Vital Voices sessions, we like to bring in people with an expertise in criminal justice, social work, or urban education to talk to our, not only our students and staff and faculty, but to the community as well. Um, but we would like to uh, take this opportunity, and we take this opportunity to um, share with everyone what we're learning here at the College of Public Service. And tonight is a special treat because we have with us Stephanie Garza, who is an alumna of our urban education program. Um, so that's so she's going to talk with Dr. Mitchell, who is uh, an, uh, one of our professors in the urban education department about social emotional learning in the era of COVID-19. But before we start, I want to tell you all about the next three Vital Voices sessions that we have scheduled for this semester. Um, next Thursday afternoon at one o'clock, we will be uh, having Dr. Carol Tavaris, who along with Elliot Aronson wrote the book, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. And that book and that conversation is gonna be about what, what is exactly implicit bias? What's cognitive dissonance? We're hearing those terms all the time. Well, what do they actually mean? So she's gonna be discussing her book. She's gonna be defining the concepts. She's gonna be using real life examples uh, from public life that we can all recognize. And it'll help us recognize our own implicit bias because we all have it. Um, so we'll, we'll, she'll be able to talk to us about that. On November 10th, Tuesday night, uh, Dr. Kevin Buckler of our criminal justice department is gonna discuss research findings from his uh, study of the processes that produce sentencing outcomes in illegal reentry cases here in federal district court here in Houston. Um, and these findings are coming from observations that he's done of sentencing hearings and uh, judicial decision-making uh, cases decided by 11 district court judges. The study is going to um, discuss frameworking guidelines and emphasis will be on how judicial sentencing outcomes are influ influenced by both judicial preference and interactions with the courtroom participants, you know, prosecutors, defense counsel, and probation officers. So that will be, that should be a very interesting uh, conversation. And that will be on Tuesday, November 10th. And then we'll close out the fall semester with um, uh, Dr. Thomas Gusky who is the professor emeritus in the College of Education at the University of Kentucky. And he is an expert on grading. And that session is gonna be titled Grading Students Learning from Home and in Hybrid Formats. Because when schools closed last spring due to the pandemic, educators at all levels had to uh, alter their grading practices and, and to accommodate changes in learning formats. So uh, this school year, educators continue to their struggle to ensure that their grading practices and policies are equitable and meaningful and fair to all students. So Dr. Gusky is an internationally renowned uh, educator focusing on these subjects. So um, he will be with us on Tuesday, November 10th. And I forgot to mention that for uh, the session next week and the session on November 10th, we're gonna uh, raffle off uh, copies of their books to the first 100 people who uh, register for those events. Okay, so let me introduce to you Dr. Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell is an associate professor in the urban education department since 2009. And previously she worked as a bilingual teacher and assistant principal in Spring ISD. She loves to work with children and students to create a safe learning environment for everybody. She taught in A-Leaf, San Antonio, and San Marcos. 
And those experiences have given her a vast knowledge base about how to prepare UHD students for bilingual education. And so we are very fortunate to have her and she is doing some amazing things upcoming and that she's gonna tell you about in the uh, spring semester. So Dr. Mitchell, take it away. And thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it so much. And it is such an honor to be here in Vital Voices. And um, just to let you guys know, it just feels so different from the way we usually do Vital Voices and sitting in the rooms together in C100. So just imagine that you're there. Uh, we are eating some of those snacks, the cheese, the, I, I just miss all of that and getting to say hello to everybody. One of the things we had suggested is something that uh, Dr. Link has done is having it this time to be a little bit more informal for our teachers. Uh, for Stephanie here, since she's had a full day of work. And then uh, if you have a chance, you know, just get comfortable and have a snack or uh, your drink of choice as Dr. Link has presented. Uh, mine is actually uh, 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 some, some uh, mineral water just to keep myself uh, normal and okay. Um, so yes, I'm a professor of bilingual and ESL here at UHD. I know many of you and I uh, and have been seeing those of you coming in. One of the big interests that I have always had, especially Stephen, it was Spring Branch ISD. Everybody gets Spring and Spring Branch ISD confused. But even as I was in um, uh, Spring Branch, we worked in social emotional learning doing tribes. And it was such a wonderful experience. And now we're doing, uh, now I'm doing social emotional learning and uh, as a facilitator in mindfulness movement uh, with a group called Breathe for Change. And as we go through the evening, I'll talk to you more about some of the competencies and how Stephanie is uh, using social emotional learning, even though she may not name it those, those ways, we'll connect it, and how she's taking care of herself and how she is uh, taking care of her students during this, these difficult times. So now I'd like to present to you one of our alums. This is Stephanie Garza and she, it, I'll let her tell more of her details, but um, she is a bilingual, first grade teacher in Galena Park. And one thing she still hasn't mentioned that we've put in our preparation talking, one of the thing, reasons she and I have gotten so close is because she was our uh, best so president, my, I think my first year that I was advisor. And um, I really love the work that she did then and I love the work that she's doing now. So Stephanie, introduce yourself. And you're on, go ahead, Stephanie. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Stephanie Garza. Thank you very much for the invite. I'm so uh, honored to be here today with y'all. Um, well, yes, as Dr. As Dr. Mitchell mentioned, mentioned um, I work for Galena Park ISD and it's been Spanish week. So, and I always do this, please uh, forget me if I get my Spanish and English all mixed the sounds and everything. That's just how my brain, my bilingual brain works. But hey, I, I'd rather be bilingual than monolingual, right? Um, I work at Pyburn Elementary. I've been working there for five years already uh, in the bilingual um, education. I've been self-contained, but it's also an inclusion-friendly classroom. Um, we do, I have GT students as well as special ed most of the years so it's it is a challenge but it's also a very good opportunity to learn um i i'm, I'm also pursuing my career at the university of st thomas i want to become an edu educational diagnostician and today i will be talking about the ways that everything changed in my classroom how much i miss having control um, but at the same time, um, what I'm doing to uh, meet my students' needs. And before I pass it on to Dr. Mitchell, I wanted to mention, uh, well, she kind of said what I wanted to say already, 
but it's okay. I just wanted to mention that she was a great mentor uh, back when I was in uh, at the University of Houston. Um, she was a, a, a great vessel advisor, even though it was her first year and I was freaking out all the time because I'm such a perfectionist person. She, was, she would always come to me and say, what are you doing to calm down? What are you doing to take care of yourself? And funny enough, five years later, well, actually almost 10 years later, she comes back and invites me to this great project. And um, if you don't mind Dr. Mitchell, me talking about our conversation as she was guiding me to, um, to figure all this out, right? All this project out. Um, I was, she was asking me, how, how are you doing in your classroom? And so I was throwing everything, you know, everything I had to say at her. And the last thing she asked me is, but what are you doing to calm down, to relax and to take care of yourself? So it's just a great opportunity to be working with her again. And she has always been a reminder and a guidance uh, in my life. So let me pass it on to you, Dr. Mitchell. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie, I appreciate that. So I am here, I'm gonna do my thing here with trying to uh, share my screen. Excuse me, Dr. Mitchell, before we start, I just wanna remind everybody that you, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can ask it in the, uh, on the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A button on the bottom right. You can type your questions in there and we will respond to them accordingly. All right, let's hope I do this right. If not, y'all be forgiving for me a bit here. So, um, uh, Stephen, can you tell me what you see? We see the slide. Okay, yay, did it right. Okay, so um, I kind of stole the title. Uh, the title's been stolen twice now, but there was a Netflix that was uh, Love in the Time of uh, co uh, c corona, and as you know, that is also in the time, uh, several other titles famous for this, but I still it for social and emotional learning in the times of COVID-19. And the reason why I chose this is because um, I was listening to our teachers and our paraprofessionals and my friends who are parents in the community and everyone was struggling about how to uh, manage the teaching education, uh, online learning, face-to-face, -face, and it was just such a struggle for everybody. And so I thought this is the time for us to start looking at how we can use um, social emotional learning in the, um, in the uh, how we're gonna be using that in the classroom. So, um, the group that I have been working with, and I'm wondering if, I don't know if Chris Ramsey is on the call. He, he was hoping to call in today. He's one of my partners. I am working with Breathe for Change, um, who also, their, their uh, role is they teach uh, social emotional learning as a facilitator and also taking care of self. That's how they came up with that, that uh, uh, signage. And then um, also thinking about mindfulness movement and bringing mindfulness movement yoga uh, to teachers and the classrooms and to the students, to children and to adolescents to learn how to self-manage and um, be self-aware and self-manage themselves in the classroom. Um, so their motto, their, their vision is to heal yourself and your community, yoga, mindfulness, and social emotional learning for educators and family. Um, so I'm going to talk more about Breathe for Change at the end of this time and some projects that we're doing with them. But what I wanted to bring in to discuss with you guys today is why I started the, wanted to do this uh, project and I want to continue it on. Um, as you know, in, our, in the learning zone, you have what we have here, the comfort zone, where you feel comfortable, but you're not challenged. You might be in the place where you feel good, um, you know what you're doing, you're happy, you're, you're, you're feeling a good place. But 
we generally want as adult learners, we want to be in the learning zone. That's why we're here. That's why you're here today. That's why we're here at the university and we keep moving into the learning zone. And as you see, it's a green, they, they have this one in green, meaning this is a go. Learnings in this learning zone, you feel challenged, but you're not frustrated. You feel good, but you're learning something new, you're learning new. And so the yellow is still, you know, just being comfortable, but the learning zone is where you want to be challenged. And then as you see the panic zone is that frustrated level and it's red meaning stop. Um, as I was listening to parents, teachers, students, um, even I, my colleagues here at the university, I was hearing teachers particularly sitting in this place right here in the panic zone. And as you know, if you're in your panic, if you're in this panic zone, you, you're not going to be learning, you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel safe. And that's what I hear from so many people right now. And we want to share with you today what uh, Stephanie is doing in the classroom, what Stephanie is doing really reflects what's going on with many of our teachers uh, across the city. And so I want we want to share uh, what is happening and let's put you in an awareness of it and then also uh, give you a chance, oops, things happen, and also give you a chance to um, just think about how we can help our teachers, help our community move back into the learning zone as we're going through this. As many of you, have, we've realized in the past weeks this is gonna continue for a while. We can't live in the panic zone if we continue like this. Um, one more thing I wanna share with you is this is the social emotional learning coming from Cassell uh, and co competencies. Um, you may know Daniel Goleman that this is much of his work. So we have social emotional learning. And so we have these areas that are important in the competencies. And the two that I've been focusing on with most of my students and with uh, my teachers is our self-awareness and self-management. And with how we can do that with our students to be aware of our emotions, how we are feeling, and then how we can manage them. And that's why uh, when we have these, uh, if we're managing and, and aware of how we are feeling, then we can start controlling what's happening to us, thinking about what's happening, becoming more social aware. And that's what we want for our teachers. We want to move from the panic zone back to the learning zone where they can be comfortably teaching and they can be learning new things and they can be teaching their students who would want to be learning new things too. Um, and my part here, I just want to talk a little bit about, this is one of my favorite pictures and I want you to think that, do we want to continue doing the same things and the same practices? Or do we want to create that diverse learning environment where we can be shifting uh, to new perspectives? And as we think about this, um, we're, we're, find, we're going to find, and I think all of us are aware that things are changing very rapidly for us in Houston, in the schools, in our, in our world, and we have to decide how are we going to manage it? What are we going to be aware of? What are we going to manage and how are we going to do it? So now I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie and she's going to share with you a little bit about uh, what she's doing in the classroom, what she has been doing and what she's doing now. And then I will come back and share a few things with her. So Stephanie, go ahead and do your thing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. All right, now I'm going to try to share my screen. Let me know, Dr. Mitchell, please, what you see. I see your screen, it looks right, it's beautiful, go. All right, bienvenidos a la clase de Miss Garza. Um, I, if I would be face to face right now, 
uh, I would be giving you hugs, kisses, and everything. Um, a, a very good Hispanic, so but I can. So I just send you air hugs and air kiss, kisses to you, to everybody. Okay. All right, a little bit about me, un poco sobre mí. Well, I lived my whole life um, in Monterrey, Mexico. I'm coming from Monterrey. I was born in Dallas, but my dad was a police officer in Mexico. So um, we lived over there for about 10, 11 years. And I had a beautiful childhood playing, you know, outside till like midnight, playing with friends, um, getting dirty and everything, but uh, my childhood um, after eight years old was not so good. My dad passed away uh, serving his country and uh, my mom widowed at age of 24 with two girls. Um, she then decided that it was time for us to, to switch uh, places to move. And we went to Tamaulipas uh, two years later. We lived there for about a year, um, you know, getting closer to the family, but it wasn't enough. She, she just needed more opportunities for us. And since, since we were um, American citizens, she thought, okay, why not go into United States? Um, so we moved to Houston. Um, did I like it in the beginning? No, to be honest, no. Uh, I did not know English. I was very afraid of the new things that, you know, everything I had to learn here. Um, and also I was bullied a lot. I was the girl who, is a, who was a Mexican and didn't know the language. And so, yeah, we have to pick on her, right? But after several years, I had, you know, great teachers that guide me through everything. And um, I decided to become a teacher. Once uh, I went to the University of Houston downtown, um, I, I did so much uh, with BESO and different students organizations. And uh, I just fall in love with it. So I'm right here um, doing BESO practices and with the students and, and I truly loved it. So I graduated um, back in fall 2010. And like I said, I've been serving five years as a bilingual teacher. I had my little award here from Galena Park ISD. And um, years later, um, I had a baby named Yetzali. And um, I'm very happy in my life now. I think um, I followed that calling and I, like I said, I am very, very, very glad I did. And, and I love what I do right now. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little tour of the Nuestro Salón de Clase. This is a video I shared with my students in the beginning of the school year. Um, we were only virtual at that time. Bienvenidos a nuestro salón. En esta parte de aquí tenemos las reglas de la clase. Acá tenemos nuestra pizarra. Aquí está nuestro enfoque diario donde vamos a aprender mucho sobre números. Arriba tenemos nuestro abecedario con los sonidos y la recta numérica. Y abajo vamos a tener nuestra pared de palabras. Vamos a poner palabras en inglés y en español que estemos aprendiendo. Acá está nuestro Scubbies, donde vamos a poder poner las mochilas y otros materiales que usemos. Este es el centro de libros grandes. Este será la estación de clasificación. Esta es la estación de computadoras. Acá será la estación de escritura creativa, donde podrás escribir 
historias muy divertidas. Acá Miss Garza te va a estar ayudando con lectura y matemáticas. Por acá tenemos nuestra mini biblioteca donde vas a poder leer libros fenomenales. Y mi parte favorita, la caja del tesoro. Aquí hay muchos premios para los niños que completan su trabajo. Por acá está la extracción de trabajo, donde vas a poder participar con tus compañeros. Y este es tu salón de clases. Como puedes ver, está listo para ti. Solo hay que esperar un poquito más. Nos vemos pronto. Ok, so as you can see, uh, that video was sent to my students because they couldn't even come, you know, to meet the teacher or anything like that. So I was like, what can I do, you know, for, for them to, to be a little closer to the classroom? In the beginning, we were four weeks direct, just virtual, directly virtual. They couldn't come to the school. They couldn't meet the teacher. They couldn't meet their classmates. So I thought maybe this video will help them feel a little better, you know, about coming back to school. Because it's a big deal, especially when buying the school supplies and everything. I feel like it, it, it's a big deal for, uh, for kids as, as students. And so I just wanted to do something nicer for them. So teaching during el COVID, Um, as my parents call it, maestra, maestra, el COVID. Um, we are doing, we were doing virtual, like I said, and now we're doing synchronous and asynchronous, meaning we're virtual, but at the same time, we're face-to-face -to -face too. So the synchronous part could be face-to-face, -face, um, either with Zoom or Google Meets. We're using Google Meets. It's supposed to be a little more secure. So um, we, I'm doing right now, and, and it's always changing, but I'm doing right now six face-to-face -face students and nine virtual students. Uh, virtual students are invited to be in the whole group instruction. Um, I'm also doing guided reading and math small groups, and I'm doing pretty much four different groups. I'm doing face-to-face -face guided reading and math small groups, and I'm doing uh, virtual guided reading and math small groups. And as Dr. Mitchell mentioned, yes, it took me about uh, four or five weeks or even six weeks uh, to get out of the panic zone um, because it was a lot of change. Um, and then the asynchronous is just pretty much apps everything that the students do on their own, like iStation, iReady, Learning A to Z, Seesaw, et cetera, you name it. Um, some of the challenges that I encounter when, especially when I was in the panic zone, uh, it was uh, the Title I school community. So where I work, it's, um, you, it might not see that it's, uh, the poverty is high, but it sort of is. Um, people don't move out of that um, uh, neighborhood. So it's like grandma, mom, and kids, you know, grandkids living in the same house. So they don't know about technology. And that was one of my biggest challenges that I had to spend in the beginning of the year, about 45 minutes, talking to each parents and teaching them you know, what to, what to do with that technology. And even though we do have support, a support line, a hotline, it's not the same. Parents and, or grandmother, you know, who actually takes care of the student while parents go to work, they, uh, they don't want to call because they feel like they're not going to understand them. So um, I had to talk to them and, you know, be a little more patient with them. Another thing is grading. Um, when we are doing tests now, it's not paper pencil uh, or it's not something based on observations because they were not with us. 
or yes, I do have six face to face, but nine, nine virtual kids, I don't, I'm not with them. So I don't truly know what they know. Uh, and it's very hard because parents, if it's like, let's say on Seesaw, parents are helping them, which is like also a good thing, you know, it builds a, a parent involvement. But at the same time, I am not sure about what they're truly learning. Another challenge was consistency and patience. As a teacher right now, you have a lot of things going on and you forget you forget about being consistent. You forget about things because it's just that the to-do list is so long and, and you don't keep track of it. And also you lose your patience. It's just so busy, you know? So it's, it's even though it's a challenge, we, we, we need to try to do something, you know, to, to be that person that you wanted to be since the beginning and think about why you wanted to be in the first place here. Um, another challenge was uh, prioritizing and organizing time. Like I was mentioning, it's just that to-do list is very long. And finding the time for my family and myself. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, was a great help uh, reminding me that I need to, to you know, think of, about myself and my family because I was just telling her um, two weeks ago my daughter, who is two and a half years old, um, she doesn't see me, you know, and maybe she sees me 45 minutes a day, an hour. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is sad, but now as, uh, when she remind me this, it's not about the time, but it's about the quality of the time that you give. So it's very important that, okay, even though she sees me for one hour a day, we're gonna have fun during that time and it's gonna be okay, it's temporary. But I'm a dedicated teacher, even from the distance. And I wanna tell you some things that I do for my students, for myself, um, trying to, you know, just, just make this world better right now, especially during El COVID. So um, I start my, Oh, all years, all the school years, I start with a little lesson. I read uh, different books during the week talking about feelings, characters' feelings, and, um, you know, good citizenship versus bad citizenship. And we do this little heart activity here. And this picture is coming from the internet. I couldn't take a picture of uh, my own, but I do it exactly the same. And um, we post it. Uh, before you speak, think, and be smart, it hard, it's hard to fix a wrinkled heart. So what we do is that as I am reading the story to them, um, this heart is like beautiful, right? Beautiful, but your paper big and very straight. And so as I am reading, I'm folding it. Let's say the character says, you know, a bad thing, uh, a, a bullying statement to, to the other characters. So I wrinkle it and I wrinkle it. And so at the end, we talked about students and I, we have open-ended class discussions. And we talked about, you know, um, what, what can we do to fix it? And they're very good at it. They might say, oh, let's, let's say, sorry. Let's say, you know, polite words. Okay, that works. And so every, every time they're telling me something else, I unwrinkle, kind of, I unfold it, that heart. But at the end, I teach them that even though you say sorry, it's not enough. Yes, we might uh, forgive, but it's hard for our mind and our hearts to truly forget. So I feel like after I started doing this lesson in the beginning of the school year, my students are more conscious about their feelings are more aware of their feelings and others' uh, feelings as well. So always allow time for open-ended class discussions. It doesn't matter the topic. It doesn't ma matter the value that you're going to talk about. Just, just allow it. You know, you can always say um, short um, stories, um, scenarios maybe, um, and not directly say it to one of the students. 
you know, like don't, don't pick on a student for doing something. Another, it's about me, daily journals. Um, uh, we write every day, every morning, and I, we've been doing all about me. And so at the end of each week, uh, and it's very repetitive, especially because I teach first grade, it's very repetitive and the sen sentence steps are pretty much the same. So we we're writing about, you know, my name is, I am blank years old, um, uh, my favorite food, my favorite movie, my favorite, you know, you name it. So uh, every time we write, we also have author share on Fridays. So they get to learn more about each other and we switch partners also. Um, and they also have to say, you know, a nice comment about the other person's writing. I always, um, when I begin my classes, now that I have face-to-face -face students, I always do a good morning, goodbye greeting. Um, and it, it looks kind of like this. And there's several out there on the internet. And But now we do it social distance. Before, you know, I, I used to give high fives and and you know, all this touching uh, each other around, but now we do social distancing. So we either smile or we move, wave our hands, uh, foot bump and so on. And so they love it. They're, they're really not missing the greeting, uh, you know, touching the teacher. So it, it, it's fun to do. It's, it's silly, but it's fun. Um, I also do Wheel of Names. That's, a, that's another idea. Um, others might be doing, you know, magical sticks or something like that. But because I wanted to incorporate more technology for the students and also for, for them to not see it as a strange thing, um, I, want, I went ahead and put all of my students' name on a wheel of name. Uh, and so I just spin it every time it's time to, you know, um, participate. And so it, it does promote it. They, they get so excited. And if they don't know the answer, it's okay. So I don't want to be like, okay, that thing pick, picked you and you have to do it. No, it's okay if you don't know it. You can just say, let me get buddy help. Let me get a friend's uh, you know, help. And it is allowed. After the friend participates, then I go back to the student and say, can you repeat what your friend helped you with? And so they do, they do listen and it's, it's teaching listening skills, it's teaching that I'm not, they're not gonna get away uh, with the, you know, move on uh, another friend uh, help. So they know that the teacher is always going uh, back to them. And also I have awards to uh, such as show and tell. So I tell them, okay, if you did good, um, during the week, especially the virtual students, because it's kind of harder to get control of. So I try to do this show and tell, and I said, okay, if you didn't get any contact marks during the week, I'm going to let you bring something in and tell about it. Now, how can I do this and not just, I don't know, like technology game? Well, technology game, I feel like it's isolated. And the show and tell, it's more for the students to know each other, to make connections between them. So students will be saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I also have a dog, just like you, you know? And so sometimes we do play that, you know, just like you, uh, just like him, just like her uh, game. We raise our hand or we stand up if we also have a dog, if we also have that thing that the person um, brought to show and tell. So I hope this. Uh, tips uh, help you um, either maybe you use them for your teachers right now if you have kids or it, when you become a teacher and because technology is not going away so I hope they, they help you in life and so that's pretty much it from me um, I believe Dr. Mitchell is going to um, connect our, um, our topics and well, let me know if you need anything. My email is right there. Uh, take a screenshot or a photo. And muchas gracias. Anything you need, I'm here to help.
All right. So thank you, Stephanie. That is wonderful. And I want to, uh, can you guys let me start my video? There we yeah. go. Yeah. There I'm back. They were, they were controlling me over there, guys. Um, I'm going to just share my screen one more time and uh, go back to my PowerPoint and make sure I do it right again. Um, first of all, I went through and checked to see that um, um, there were a lot of my students uh, on the call. And so that have called in on Zoom. And I hope that as you listen to Stephanie, um, and I can't seem to get things to move, guys. Um, as you listen to Stephanie, the things that we talk about in class, I want to say that I, I could take all the credit for Stephanie um, doing this, uh, uh, that I taught her this, but she knew how to do so much of this on her own, and she has just taken it to such a great level. Um, guys, I can't move my PowerPoint. Let's see, any chance I need to re share my screen again? You just move to a different slide. Um, Try the down arrows. There you go. Okay, you go. so I'm on the bottom screen, is that correct? You're, uh, no, you're on Breathe for Change. All right, we'll stay right there. So uh, a couple of things that I want to do with what Stephanie uh, was talking about is just talk about some of the things that she does and how they connect to that social, emotional, and learning uh, uh, classroom and how she has that, even though she might not have used some of the words uh, that we use in the competencies. So first of all, I think you could see from that video, wasn't that beautiful for her to share to all of her students when they were wishing they could be in school, that here they are first graders, that big moment, parents take their kids to school, meet the teacher, all those wonderful experiences, the, the wonderful less, um, school supplies, and they didn't have that experience. And so Stephanie provided for them with that video of what their classroom looks like and how it's waiting for them. And I just love that because it gives them that sense of, um, uh, of inclusion and hope. I get to go to that school soon. That is my classroom. And so she really gives them that sense that they belong to her and to the classroom. Um, as she was talking about uh, the virtual learning that she does, um, as uh, she was giving them that safe learning environment, making them feel invited if they were virtual, that they're that, they are part of the group. If they're face-to-face, -face, they're also part of the group. And then as she just described all those uh, wonderful uh, activities that she does in terms of greeting the students in the morning, teaching them kindness and different ways to uh, take care of each other. She is really giving them that sense of self-awareness and helping those first graders to start identifying their emotions that they're feeling. Um, if, if they say something that hurts somebody else's feelings, they may not be aware of that. So she's teaching them how to, uh, to be aware that what they say and do might hurt other people. And through, through the heart, the crinkled and wrinkled heart, um, also, our, many of our kids are not aware that when they feel something inside, it might be uh, an, a, an emotion of anger, or it might be mad. And they're used to just reacting. So I'm mad, I'm going to kick. Or I'm angry, I'm going to hit. And so as Stephanie's teaching them through the books, She's showing them that when you have certain kind of emotions, this is how you feel inside. And if you react in a certain way, 
like kicking or hitting, you hurt somebody, you make them feel bad, or you physically hurt them. And so that moves them into that self-management stage of being able to say, okay, I'm angry, I'm mad, and I can't kick, I can't hit. But I can say, you make me mad because, and that's where she's giving them the opportunities in those classroom discussions. So they can say, I feel mad when, and they can describe things about home. I feel mad when my mom makes me go to bed at night. I feel happy when we get to get ice cream. Uh, those are the kind of things that help them have that self-awareness and then self-management. And that's really important in social emotional learning. The other thing that Stephanie is talking about is being consistent uh, with her routines. And even now as they're writing in journals and they're doing different activities, she's keeping them in a consistent process. And I'm sure the parents at home with the virtual learners, they're learning too. As, as you guys have heard and many of you have experienced that the virtual learners are having to be at home with their parents and the parents have to help them onto those programs, those apps, Seesaw and um, all the different ones she named, plus there's so many more and they're having to figure this out too and say, hey, you have to pay attention to your teacher. Now listen to your teacher. Go get, you're gonna, gonna get into the group with your teacher now. It's time for your guided learning. Those are tough things for parents to be doing, not only for the children, but the parents. And so Stephanie is over here, not only guiding her, her students in the uh, virtual learning and the classroom, she's guiding the parents and she's helping the parents she's showing the parents the technology and as you can just imagine that's really really dif difficult and she's also doing student-centered learning which we are really big about teaching in urban ed and giving them chances to share and help each other with buddy sharing if they are called on to answer a question and they don't have the answer instead of being embarrassed or making you feel bad because you don't know you can just say choose a buddy and she's suggesting ways that they can support each other in the learning so that student-centered learning and then the biggest thing that i hear as stephanie's talking is uh building community so um i as you can see, I think you, as you're listening to Stephanie talk, you see she's dealing with a lot and she has been dealing with a lot. And as she says, uh, I, I really appreciate Stephanie that you said you were in the panic zone and that I, I actually was able to give you some words for that, but you really showed that to us and that the that uh, we have been the, in the school districts, I know for a fact, you know, this, uh, I've been hearing from different teachers and parents, they start out face to face, then they had to go to virtual and then they are back to face to face. One of my teachers that uh, is a master's student here shared that just out of the blue, they announced next week, you'll be face to face with your students. And she teaches pre-K and so within three or four days, she had to get ready for uh, 20 pre-Kers in her classroom face-to-face -face when they had been doing uh, uh, virtual learning. So that's really throwing our teachers into this, this panic zone. And what I think we should do as a community and what I hope can start happening now yeah, as we're living in this environment um, and we're going to live in these, this kind of environment for quite a while. I hope that we are able to um, help and support each other to move into that green learning zone. So we can learn, like Stephanie said, the, the virtual learning is gonna stay with us. Um, even as we move back to the classroom, there is gonna be so much virtual learning. Uh, I was just reading about things that we'll be doing on Zoom probably from now on uh, because of where we are no matter what. So we wanna be in that green zone where we're learning new things. So um, 
uh, what I'd like to do, I think, Stephen, what we were ready to do is to go back to you for some question and answers. And then you'll give me a last five minutes to do a plug for brief for change, if that's okay. That's fine. But right now we have, does anyone have a question? I know that there's, there are no uh, questions in the Q&A log there, but if anyone does have a question for Stephanie or Dr. Mitchell, uh, please um, put it down in the Q&A log. Uh, Stephanie, let me ask you while we're waiting, how, how soon after you uh, went to school here and got your bachelor's, did you start teaching? Was it immediate? Right away, yes. I wasn't even, it wasn't even my graduation day yet when I got a call from the principal. And I was, I do remember the exact time I was doing homework or maybe, you know, uh, preparing for a final, something like that um, over there uh, in the computer lab. And I got this call and I was, I think I was so focused that I didn't even notice how I answered that phone, that phone call. And I was like, kind of like saying yes or what or you know something like that and then there was this guy started talking about all these you know formal stuff and everything and that he heard about me and, and and everything and I was like I'm sorry who's this and he's like oh a principal from and so I guess he told me about it but I never I didn't even I was just so focused so after I you know caught the whole information. I was like, oh, okay, I'm so sorry. You know, and I went back to formal. And so, yeah, right away he said, we need a teacher. Uh, and, and it was December. It was, it was the, at the end of fall semester. And so he said, you know, I need to meet you and come in, uh, you know, uh, for questions or anything. And actually when I went um, for the interview, he didn't really interview me. I interviewed them, which is, which is pretty funny, but I was the one. And Dr. Mitchell will say, yes, you're that type of person, Stephanie. Yes. Um, yes, I was like, do you support bilingual education? What did you do? And then how, how am I going to get support? So I was always, you know, asking questions and I'm still that person. And my principal knows me for that. And I mean, like I said, I've been there five years and I truly love Pyron. That's wonderful. All right, we have some questions in the Q&A box. Let me ask you, how are you balancing, uh, Dr. Bhattacharji is asking, how are you balancing having to teach face-to-face -face and online at the same time? I, I can't even imagine, that must be really hard. Yeah, well, first of all, hola, Dr. Bhattacharji. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here with us today. Um, balancing, yes, it's, my schedule, it's crazy right now, to be honest. And it's always changing, especially because it was all virtual and then face-to-face -face virtual with some kids. And then next week, I'm getting four more face-to-face uh, -face kids, which is going to put 10 kids in the classroom and only five online. So managing, well, it, it's hard. I'm, I'm going to try to explain. I am uh, most of my, uh, most of the time in a computer and I do everything from my computer, but I do, you know, walk around the classroom. And I mean, I always talk to both uh, groups because it's at the same time and simultaneously. So uh, I try to incorporate everything that I was going to do instead of a read aloud with the book. I know Dr. Mitchell, you're not going to love this but sometimes it's just necessary. Um, I don't have a book anymore because if I read it lot out and whatever my face-to-face, -face, well, first of all, my face-to-face -face kids cannot be in a small group. I mean, in a, in a whole group, um, you know, close to each other. And so what I do is that I project it or I try to use Epic books, um, uh, reading aid is the books also, whatever I can find there, or if there are books that are, were previously, you know, uh, scanned, um, I try to project it. So I read to them. And so it's, it's visible for everybody. And so I still ask questions instead of the pick me sticks, I do the will of names. So I just try to, like I said, incorporate all the techno technology so that everybody is looking at that and they're engaged. 
I don't know if that answers your question. So when you when you do like when you're doing a reading, are you reading from behind the uh, desk so that you're on the computer, but then your students also see you as well, and your your students in the classroom also see you at the same time? Yes. Yes. Is that what you do? So what I do is pretty much what we did today. Uh, if, even though it's a little different uh, because Zoom lets you share screen and you can see everybody, but Google Meet, what we're using, once I share screen, I cannot see my students. So what I do is that I have a second device. I usually use my regular computer, you know, the teacher computer to do the share screen and, and everything else, but I have my own laptop on the side to, to see the faces of my students because it's not nice to be reading to students that can't see me, you know? Yeah. So at least I want them nodding their heads. I want to see that, you know, laughing or giggling, smiling. I need that. I need that. I need that um, feedback from them that they that, like what they're seeing. That's interesting, I think, for, for uh, I mean, that's important that uh, that's a very good point because you, uh, you as the teacher, as, as the, the head of the class, you need that same interaction just as much as the students need it. Yes, I've been saying it since day one. Please bring my students back. I need them. I, that's, that's my fuel. You know, every day, uh, that first day where, when I went to, you know, the first day of school and it was all virtual, I did cry, I have to say. I did cry because I was like, so much science in here. Where are my students? Where are my little faces? You know, and it's okay that social distancing, but as long as I see them, as long as I see them well, because that's another thing. I do worry about them. You know, all this violence uh, growing and, and it's just, I need to see them. I need to see that they're okay. I need to be able to talk to them. And that's what my face-to-face -face students can do right now. When I do those uh, morning greetings, that's the first thing I say, you know, how would you like me to greet you this morning? And how are you? And so, they're very talkative and they do say all kinds of stuff. And so I'm like, oh, okay, you know, very interesting or oh, how sad. I hope you're, you have a better day today. But it gives me a lot of feedback, totally seeing them. It's, it's I feel way easier to, to manage. That's important. All right, Ste Sonia Simmons has a question here. She said, Stephanie, you mentioned that Dr. Mitchell asks her, asked you what she's doing to take care of yourself. So what do you and Dr. Mitchell do to take care of your mental health when you guys are in the panic zone? And we'll start with you, Dr. Mitchell. What do you do when you're in the panic zone? So I think that like many of you and uh, many of our professors, uh, since March, we've all been pretty much in a panic zone too. And so um, I am learning to do some just deep breathing and some um, uh, making sure I'm taking time in the morning. I have to take time in the morning to uh, wake up and um, I do some mindfulness movement stretches to get my neck moving, my back moving. And uh, if I don't do these things, I'm kind of grouchy the rest of the day. So I've been doing that. And then one of the other things that I've been sharing with some of my colleagues, um, I am exercising much more. I'm taking time to exercise. Um, I am doing yoga. I'm participating at the Y. The Y is open and many of the Ys are open and I feel like it's safe to go there. So I've been doing yoga classes and I have been doing swimming. And so sometimes if you don't see me at a meeting, Dr. Schwartz, um, I may have slipped off to get to the pool or get to the yoga class uh, just to take care of myself that day. So those are some things I'm doing. Thank you. How about you, Stephanie? What are you doing? Okay, I have to have breakfast. That's the most important meal of the day. Uh, I usually do a quick smoothie. I put oats, I put bananas, you know, something sweet yet uh, healthy. Um, I also take time um, either in the morning or whenever I feel like I need it, I take my deep breaths and, and I just have to remind myself how, how lucky I am, how blessed I am 
to be in this position. And same thing when I'm, I'm in my, the panic zone, I, I do get excited attacks sometimes. Uh, and we were talking about that last time, Dr. Mitchell, how your brain, you were explaining to me how your brain as being short of bread, they, it, it, it sends you that message of you're not okay, hold on, you have to do something about it. So that's the whole panic, you know, but you also, you're the only person that can help yourself. You have to, to work your mind and, and say, I'm okay, I still have a job, uh, I have a, a healthy family, and, and that's what's matter, to be honest. We are alive, and that's what matters. Thank you. All right, I have a question here from Isaac. Uh, forgive me if I'm saying your name's wrong, Julia. Uh, what kind of issues have you come across when trying to engage parents? Have you had any feedback on how they feel about virtual learning? Yes, parents are very frustrated for sure. And um, with everything, with technology, with the changes, with, with not knowing uh, their own personal you know, problems, they might not have a job or they might be three days job and then no job. And so it, it is very stressful for sure. But what I try to do since day one is always um, meeting with them, even though, and actually I feel like I have I've been having more communication with using the technology than before because it's easier for them to just send them a link uh, via messages. And we do something that is called school status. Uh, school status, what it does is that it's kind of like Remind 101. It um, hides your phone number, but you can still use your phone to message or call, which is great. You don't have to use the, the phone, uh, school phones anymore. So it's pretty neat. I just send them that link. They open the, the, the Zoom link and I meet with them. And I do same thing. I do little presentations, you know, PowerPoints, uh, Google Slides to show them because they're virtual learners um, to show them, you know, how is it going to look, uh, show them the schedule, try to have them as, as, as much communicated as possible. Um, and what I get as a feedback is that, yes, they do say, you know, I don't like this Miss Garza or this is stressing me out, but they do say it, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that, that they do say it in a, such a polite way. Uh, I've been so polite to them and so respectful to them and always saying, mama, papa, I know, I totally get it. Abuelita, I know, I know the struggle. I grew up in Mexico. And I always go back to that so that they know I'm not, just from here, I was in all lucky, you know, that I also, I also have challenges. And I said, it's temporary, just, it's okay. Um, and if they're scared, let's say, oh, Ms. Garza, we didn't have time last night, I don't know, to turn in this. It's okay, they still have a whole week. Um, so I do try to give them, you know, more time, um, trying to understand as much as possible and be pretty flexible. How many hours a week do you, how many hours a day do you work? <laughs> um, well, um, eight, no, that's a <laughs> lie for sure. Um, if, if I add, you know, answering to text messages, emails and everything after school, before school, uh, I would say 10. It's not that bad. It's not a, that bad. I have, my first grade team is awesome. Uh, supporting each other and one person does what, one thing and the other person takes care of the other thing. I'm the technology person, um, the, the hacker they call it. Um, but yes, I mean, everybody does their part um, or we jump in and do, you know, whatever we feel comfortable with. And, and that has to do a lot with feeling um, less, you know, stress. Um, the team but yes, yeah. I mean, I, I would say 10, it's not as bad. Okay. And sometimes those conversations with parents are great, to be honest. They're funny. They're, they're so much fun to, to be talking to. That's good that you have that, that perspective. All right, we have uh, uh, Cynthia Sanchez wants to know, what's your first and most, most important advice for future teachers? She's a current student teacher. 
So what's your advice? Okay. Um, my most important advice will be get used to change. <laughs> get used to it. Embrace it. Just like Dr. Nietzsche said, get out of the panic zone and take it as a learning zone. Yes, you are learning every step and just be patient with yourself, especially, I'm, I'm saying this, Dr. Nietzsche, you should be very proud of myself. Um, yes, I, like I said, I was a perfectionist all the way and I, I suffered, I suffered for, from being like that. So don't do what I used to do be patient with yourself, talk to yourself, be proud of yourself and, and just embrace change. It's okay. Wow, that's change great. is okay. It's a big deal, Stephanie. Good to hear that. It's hard to do, but it is important. Five years after she's left, she's, she's still the teacher. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Elizabeth Heno, 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 Heno wants to know, uh, Mrs. Garza, did the phone call come that you got from the district uh, that you, um, your, your, the, I guess, Galena Park, was, did that come from the district that you were student teaching in? No, well, it, it came directly from the principal's uh, phone. But yes, it was- His was, cell phone, he called me directly, and it was, I believe, almost 9 p.m. But was it from the same district that you did your student teaching in? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It was from Galena Park. Yes, the same. I've been teaching at Tyburn these five years and I haven't moved. All right. So um, we have, uh, da, 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 see, Dr. Link would like to know, besides proactive communication, what else do you advise teachers do to limit students and parents' stress about grades? One thing that I do right now is Seesaw. Seesaw is my best tool right now. Yes, it can be challenging and, and probably too much going on in the beginning, you know, when you're learning about it. But Seesaw allows you, or Google Classroom, some, um, I think upper grade uh, grades are using Google Classroom. Um, they allow you to, for the students to turn in their assignment, you take a look at them and you always return them. And so you can comment on that. I love Seesaw for lower grades where you can actually use your microphone and record that instead of them trying to read it. So you can just comment, give feedback and say, oh, you know, great job on this, but you didn't do this part. And so just, just go back and do it. And you can always record a little reteaching, you know, uh, part of it and they, they do great. And um, sometimes I do put, let's say I put, okay, this was 660, let's say. And then I say, but if you do this, you can, you know, build up to a hundred. So they do it and, and I'm, I'm totally fine with it. So I don't really take grades until like the next week. So I'm like always behind one week sort of so that I can give enough, um, enough time for my students to, you know, correct their mistakes. And that obviously re reduces parents' stress anyway. Yes. So we have a qu another question here. How have you found greater stress vocalized with in-person? Oh no, or have you found greater stress vocalized with in-person or remote learners? I don't, I, I really don't know. I, it's, it's hard to answer that question. It, it has pros and cons, both of them with, um, with in-person, I notice that if, I, if I'm simultaneously teaching and I'm, I, I tend to be more in my computer, which I don't like, you know, the teacher desk, if you want to call it that way. Um, even though I do walk around the, the, their learning zone, it's, it's, they know that I'm not 100% there. Like before that proximity, uh, it's a little harder to maintain. So they'll go off topic, off task, if I'm more in my computer. Um, and remote learners, same, same thing. It's, it's hard to control. I think I would say those are the most, not the students itself, but the, the whole teaching part of the remote learners. It would be not being able to control their, their environment because we don't know, they're muted. We don't know exactly 
if they have another tab, I've seen that where they have another tab and they're watching a video or they're there, but their volume is all the way down that they cannot hear me and they're watching TV. <laughs> and um, I don't know, other family members are playing reggaeton on the background, <laughs> trying to clean the house and cook at the same time. So it, I would say it's not the students itself, but the whole atmosphere, the environment where they are living now, what they're experiencing now, I, I'm not 100% sure of, of, of their environment, you know, so I, I don't know how to help sometimes. Right. I think, I think, I think that's the same with adult, uh, adults as well. When all these Zoom calls, I mean, I see people and I'm guilty of it myself. I'm looking at my phone or I'm doing something else. Uh, so yeah, I can imagine that would be a and challenge. We, know we would not do it in person. We yeah. know uh, if I was with Dr. Mitchell, I would not be looking on my phone, you know, but uh, it is easier. Temptation is easier when you're just uh, in Zoom. All right, so let me ask you another question here. Um, for, vir for teaching virtual, what kind of technology equipment does the school district provide to you as a teacher? Um, they do have um, uh, Chromebooks. I did ask if I could get it, but because my district is still short on the Chromebooks, they couldn't provide me one. Of course they want to. I mean, nothing wrong with giving it to the teacher. But we are moving on so fast, you know, from not having Chromebooks enough for a classroom. Now we're like into a ratio of every two students gets one, well, every two siblings gets one. And so now we're doing more one-to-one. -one. And so it's, they would provide it to me, but they couldn't at, at that moment in the beginning. So that's why I had to bring my own device. Um, we're using iPads as well that we have in the classroom. We can use those um, but because it's, it's limited sort of. I just prefer my own uh, computer and it was easier for me just to bring it. Uh, but they do provide, they do provide on whatever they have. I'm sure they're always happy to help you. Okay, and a final question we have here is, how do you make accommodations for your special education and gifted students who are, are learning virtually? Okay, so let me mention this. I do have an autistic, a student with autism um, and he's GT at the same time. So we're doing GT projects and uh, Seesaw activities will do it. Uh, he has like a separate folder for GT, for the GT project. So that's differentiating instruction. Um, and the past program uh, is their staff is doing a lot where they have my link to my Google Meet. And so they join with that when that student is, it's going to be, you know, virtually learning. And so they have these posters that they hold up if the student needs a reminder. So it's free of interruption. And it's a great visual reminder for that student. And it's very beneficial for them. So if I'm, let's say I'm teaching and I'm in, my, in the middle of teaching and I, I mean, I, I don't wanna interrupt my, my teaching or, you know, it's, it's just harder when it's, and when it's virtual, virtual because face-to-face, -face, I will just totally show the card to him or go and, and do proximity and tap of, of, uh, on his desk or give him a break. Um, but now it's a little harder, right? So that person is there to support us and, and remind, uh, re redirect that student positively. All right, so um, before I turn it over to you, Dr. Mitchell, I just wanna um, ask everyone, I put a, a link to, first of all, I put a, a link to Dr. Mitchell's PowerPoint presentation if you wanted to uh, download that. And I also put a, a link to a survey uh, it's, it'll literally take you 10 seconds, probably even quicker than that. Uh, if you could click on the link, it's in the chat um, area. If you could click on that link and take that survey, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, all right, so Dr. Mitchell, you wanna close us out with information about Breathe for Change? Yes, I do. I kind of want to close out with, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Stephanie, so much. You have done such a good job and really given us a good idea of what's going on in the classroom. And I think that's so helpful. And, and you're doing a beautiful job and continue with your good work. 
Uh, your students really deserve the hard work you're giving them. Also, thank you for your questions, everybody. Those were great questions and I really appreciate it. That gave Stephanie time to share even more about some of the things that she's doing. And I appreciate that uh, input and for being here tonight. Um, what I do wanna say is that uh, I'm not gonna pull up a slide. Um, Breathe for Change is this organization that is working with teachers across the country and uh, they are preparing teachers to do social emotional learning, mindfulness, and also um, yoga in the classrooms. And so the teachers are going in, they are, I'm working with a group of 200 right now, we're in training. I'm in yoga training, if you can imagine. And um, we are, they are actually teachers in the classroom, for uh, principals, all across the country and they are doing, you know, in yoga, you do sun salutation, hands up, hands to the heart. And then the way we translate it for the students is we call it a sun dance. And they do the same kind of thing, but it's a little bit more informal and it's not so, sometimes people think of yoga as a very precise uh, work, but this is really helping the students to loosen up, uh, take breaks, uh, and also find themselves uh, in so many ways. Um, uh, one of the things that we are going to do is we are organizing a professional development for it will, for hopefully January, January or February here in Houston uh, with a couple of school districts, University of Houston downtown and Breathe for Change. It will be remote, it will be virtual. So uh, be on the lookout for advertisement through Stephen's office and through different our different advertising to the university. And if you're interested in just seeing what they're about and, and learning a little bit about this, um, this is a really good time. It'll be a two hour or a six hour training. We haven't decided exactly. Um, to give you a taste of what it's like and then how you can use it for yourself or for uh, your students if you, uh, or people that your groups that you're working with. So to close this out, I would like to do some uh, mindfulness that we do in Breathe for Change and that uh, many of you have done this with me already, but I did something new today with my class and I know my class is here. So I'm going to play a chime and when you hear the chime end, I want you to make a sign, make a thumbs up sign. We won't get to see, but the others will, hopefully, I don't know. Steven, you have to participate. And Stephanie, I need you to come on so you can help. So we're gonna make a sign like thumbs up. Okay, um, how is it? I was gonna do Texas, Texas fight. Um, <laughs> Um, maybe uh, hang 10 or I love you, I heart you. And then the Brief for Change group, they like to do peace and like this, like kind of like peace out. So I'm going to um, play the chime and I want you to listen to the chime and just kind of take some deep breaths while you're hearing it because it, I think it's a pleasant sound. And then as soon as you don't hear the chime anymore, come up with your sign. And Steven, you and Stephanie are modeling this for us, so I hope you've got it. Ready? All right, here we go. So that brings a little bit of quiet. And as you think about how you can bring quiet to your students, to your family, to yourself, now what I'd like you to do is to take three deep breaths. And I'm gonna ask you to take, put your hands on your belly or your heart and just take a deep breath and let it out. Take another deep breath, let it out. And on this last one, take a deep breath and make an audible sound. <sighs> so
So tonight we're going to leave you thinking about how do you want to be? Do you want to continue the same practices, doing the same thing, doing the status quo? Are you going to be that change maker? Are you going to be like Stephanie in there doing the change, doing the work? and taking care of yourself while you're taking care of others. So thank you so much for your time tonight and for listening. So proud that you're here with us tonight. It was a pleasure. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Very beautiful. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.